honouring another woman from the 20th century who gives us a potential model for discipleship. It felt to me very much last night as though I had been given a tour de force display of what you might call join up the dots theology because I spent most of the rest of the evening thinking about what the implications were for me in my local ministry and for the congregation that I serve. And I imagine many of us may have been experiencing that and will continue to do so as we journey this morning and this afternoon with Rowan. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. <laughs> One thing you'll discover, Love Day, is that they're, they're a very good audience. <laughs> so it's a good house. <laughs> so moving on this morning, I'm going to be speaking this morning about yet another formidable, creative, difficult woman <laughs> whose, whose way of discipleship, whose, whose path of critical faithfulness led her to the very edges of the comfortable territory of the church. And this is Dorothy Day. It's a name obviously known to more of you than Maria Skoptsova, and probably more than this afternoon's as well. Um, Dorothy Day, born in 1897 and died in 1980, I think. That's right. Um, and known mostly for her founding of the Catholic worker movement in the United States of America a very, very important network of social witness and solidarity. But just like Mother Maria, she was somebody who came from a really very unlikely background, from a quite comfortable household in California originally. She became, as a young woman, heavily involved, just like Mother Maria, with artistic, political circles. She adopted a very radical political stance, she was involved with all kinds of left-wing activism in the United States. She had a number of affairs and relationships. She had an abortion. She had a child out of wedlock. Um, and again, like Mother Maria, not the obvious CV for a saint of the church. But it was when her daughter, Tamar, was born that she began to wonder if there was something she wasn't connecting to somewhere. She's not the first, and I'm pretty sure she won't be the last person for whom giving birth to a child was a spiritual breakthrough. And to her own surprise, she felt an impulse to have her daughter baptized. And having done that, she not unnaturally thought, well, if baptism is good for my daughter, perhaps dot, dot, dot. So she made her peace with the Roman Catholic Church, and for the rest of her quite long life, was a passionately faithful and unfailingly difficult Roman Catholic. <laughs> because her baptism didn't change her artistic or political views at all, any more than with Mother Maria. Quite early on in her life as a Roman Catholic, she met an extraordinary Frenchman called Pierre Morin, Peter Morin, who had emigrated to the United States. And Morin was, that's M-A-U-R-I-N. I don't, sorry, I'm no good at handouts and um, slides and things, but <laughs> sorry. Um, Morin was basically a French peasant sage, somebody with practically no formal education, who was given to writing short, dense, punchy essays on Christian discipleship and Christian faithfulness, sort of one word paragraphs on what to do as a Christian. And he believed very strongly that the church's greatest failure was its failure to, as he liked to put it, to engage with the world so as to make the world an easier place to be good in. Which is quite a formulation, isn't it? Engage with the world so as to make the world an easier place to be good in. So he wasn't thinking primarily of the church as an agency of recruitment, he was thinking of it as an agent of evangelization, but in a very broad and very activist way. The church was always going to be 
grappling with its social context, not to dominate it, not to own it, not to control everybody, but somehow, by its own deep, costly discipleship, to help to make the whole social environment a place where it was that much more natural to be humane, to be compassionate, and to be generous than might otherwise be the case. I do know I think that's actually a pretty good strapline for the Church of God, that we don't seek to control, to own, to dominate. We do seek, bit by bit, to make our environment, wherever we are, locally, nationally, internationally, to make our environment one in which it seems that little bit more natural, more obvious to be compassionate, that little bit more obvious to be generous. Well, that was Peter Morin's vision, and it was one which, as you might expect, captured the imagination of the young Dorothy Day. But how was this going to be done? This is the age of the Great Depression in the United States. Unprecedented levels of unemployment and homelessness, and unprecedented numbers of people on the roads. So Dorothy Day and Peter Morin decided that the best thing they could do was to set up what they called houses of hospitality. That is, places where the homeless and the jobless could be welcomed. Initially, these were centres in cities, big cities. After a bit, they managed to get hold of a couple of rural properties, which functioned as places of sort of retreat for them as well. And out of that grew what came to be called the Catholic Worker Movement. It's actually a slightly misleading title because Catholic Worker Movement sounds a bit like a, a sort of um, society for Catholics who are employed in factories or something. And it wasn't really that at all. It was simply a title for that network of hospitality and service radical welcome that Dorothy Day and Peter Morin set in motion. And from the very early days, they published a journal called The Catholic Worker, which is still going. Some of you may have seen copies of it. Um, and they made the decision that they would never sell this for more than one cent. So for decades and decades, The Catholic Worker was sold just for one cent. And that was partly because if I remember rightly, there was some rather complicated business about the extra money you had to pay if you mailed it out free to people. <laughs> they were always very cagey about presenting themselves as a charity because charities had tax exemptions and privileges and they were rather concerned not to look for privileges. And right through their lives... Dorothy Day and Peter Morin and all those others involved in the Catholic worker, right through their lives, they wanted to keep out of the mainstream of religious charity. And yet again, we're reminded of Mother Maria. This is not a matter of a group doing good things to somebody else. It's a matter of a community. And yet, she can... She can write, if I can find the quotation now, rather forcefully about the fact that they're not a community in the, the usual sense. They're not a religious community. We're not a Christian or a religious community. We are, she says, an inn by the side of the road. An inn by the side of the road. And she's writing that not coincidentally um, the day after Christmas in the 1970s. Why do I start this year's chronicle on such a note? We are not a community, a Christian or a religious community, that is. We are an inn by the side of the road. We have no common sense. <laughs> we do not say no, or be thou warm, sheltered and fed, and not do it. God says yes to us. He gave us free will. At what a price. The suffering and cruel death, the passion of Jesus Christ, true God and true man who came to repair the fall, the worst has already happened and been repaired, Julian of Norwich said. Love God and do as you will, St. Augustine. And then obviously reminded of this phrase by what she's just written, she quotes St. Teresa of Avila, 
Life is a night spent in a disorderly inn. And Theresa knew a lot about disorderly inns, having travelled so much in her own life and ministry. An inn by the side of the road. So this notion of hospitality is key for Dorothy Day. She took that from Peter Mora. She developed it. She constantly insisted that the Catholic worker houses, the houses of hospitality, should be genuinely communal, not divided into workers and recipients. And that cost a great deal, because as her diaries show in great detail, she was, of course, like Mother Maria, surrounded by people with exceptional, difficult, complex needs. She writes poignantly at times about the amount of abuse and criticism that she suffers, the amount of disorder, even literally violence, that could happen in some of these houses, the difficulty of protecting people from one another sometimes. How do you cope if you have a potentially violent alcoholic in a house where there are vulnerable people? And the whole of the life of the Catholic worker was, I have to say, a health and safety and safeguarding nightmare. <laughs> it would not have lasted five minutes in the present climate. But reading about this is still enormously challenging and enormously moving, and not least moving, is Dorothy Day's meditation on the cost of all this. Here she is writing in the 1940s. When we are dead, we no longer suffer. We are no longer chastised. When we are dead to ourselves. The preceding paragraph was written two months ago, and a few weeks ago a very hard experience began. Michael first, then Cyril, began tormenting me with demands for the impossible. Michael, that I get him back to the seminary from which he was dismissed five years ago. Cyril, that I take him to Easton and give him a private room for his mind's health. He's recently been released from Rockland State Hospital for the Insane, where he'd been confined for trying to kill his brother. This persecution lasted weeks. On Michael's part, it had been recurrent for years, but this was the worst. He would come in and stand over me with livid face, sweat rolling down his face, call down curses from heaven on me, damning my soul to the lowest hell for interfering, as he said, with his vocation. He was going to see to it. He protested that I was going to be punished and all who worked with me. I was afraid for a time that he would set fire to the house. I was afraid coming and going. People have trembled with rage as they approached me, shaking their fists, shouting, beating on the table. One night I dreamt that I was struck. I have a haunting memory of having read somewhere of a woman being torn to pieces by a mob, and I felt so surrounded by hatred that I was afraid. That fear, that utter vulnerability, is something which recurs decade after decade. Dorothy Day lived to be quite an old woman. She died well in her 80s, active to the last, but still living in these chaotic little communities where she was accessible to everybody. Some of the most moving pages in the diaries are the pages where she says something to the effect of, I had a couple of hours off this Sunday and listened to an opera on the radio. And you feel that this is an unimaginable gift and luxury for her. But as the Catholic worker vocation unfolded, something rather different began to happen. The economic situation in the United States was, of course, radically different after the Second World War. And the problem wasn't so much. The number of derelict, vagrant, unemployed, disturbed people on the roads. The problem was national. And this is one of the most interesting things about Dorothy Day's evolution spiritually. The problem was national. It was a problem about the morality of a whole society, she felt. The United States, so she believed, had been caught up in the Second World War and had come to think of warfare, the military machine, as, so to speak, the default setting for societies. You remember President Eisenhower's <clears throat> famous phrase about the military-industrial complex taking over the economy of the United States. Dorothy Day spotted this early on and therefore began as early as the 1950s, 
to agitate and protest about war, about the <clears throat> nuclear armaments of the United States, about the wars that were beginning already in the 50s in Korea and so on. And she became even more celebrated in the 60s as a persistent vocal critic of the Vietnam War. So some of the vagrants and marginal people that she and her colleagues were dealing with in the 1960s and early 70s were draft evaders, people trying to get away from conscription in the United States. And Dorothy and others from the Catholic worker were prominent in marches and protests about war. They attempted to minimize the tax they paid so that they wouldn't be supporting war by indirect means. And Dorothy was more than once arrested for her part in protests. There's one very nice little anecdote which tells us something about another famous figure of the period, the poet W.H. Auden. Dorothy had appeared in court in New York for taking part in a sit-in protest. She'd been hauled off by police and she'd been fined $250. Um, as she was coming out of the courtroom, um, a shambling, disheveled, elderly figure pushed out of the crowd towards her and shoved an envelope into her hands and muttered, there's 250. And she thought, oh, how touching. Some you know, poor homeless chap has given me $2.50. <laughs> and when she opened the envelope later, it was a check for $250, signed W.H. Auden. <laughs> <laughs> so that witness to peace became more and more a dominating feature of her and the Catholic workers' vocation. She and they were absolute, uncompromising pacifists. They believed that violence of any kind in any situation was sinful. In this, at least, she parts company from Mother Maria, who has some agonized reflections on the possible necessity of military action in the face, say, of German fascism. Dorothy Day is, in a sense, answering a different kind of question. Yes, they do disagree, but the immediate presenting challenges are very different. What she's most worried about is what you might call the normalization of massive violence. The fact of a whole society that fails to notice how much of its corporate energy and resource is being poured into the manufacture of death. That's what she's concerned about, and that's the witness she wants to keep firmly in focus. Throughout her life, she never sought to make the Catholic worker anything other than a minority, anything other than a marginal group. She didn't try to recruit huge numbers of people to her philosophy and her approach. She didn't try to set up any kind of separate institution alongside the church that she loved and hated. And that's the critical fidelity thing once again. She, I think, puzzled generation after generation of Roman Catholic bishops in the United States by loudly proclaiming her absolute fidelity and obedience to the Catholic Church and failing completely to do what the bishops told her to do the rest of the time. <laughs> I have to say in brackets that that at least is utterly unsurprising for Anglicans, but uh, <clears throat> let's just pass on hastily there. <laughs> but it meant that she, in a sense, she was protected. She was always ready to say, I will do what bishops tell me, but, and it's a big but, I will do not what an individual bishop wants, I will do what the church through the bishop tells me. So in one famous standoff, she'd had some tellings off from the Cardinal Archbishop of New York, Francis Spellman, who was a, an eloquent and uncritical supporter of the Vietnam War and the anti-communist crusade, and really a very uh, problematic personality altogether. And Dorothy Day had 
gently but firmly come back to say, well, you know, yes, your eminence, I respect your position. Is this the doctrine of the church or is this your personal opinion? And finally, when to her delight, Pope John XXIII made a fairly unambiguous declaration about the evils of weapons of mass destruction and nuclear war, she triumphantly sent a little note to Cardinal Spellman saying, <clears throat> apparently this is the teaching of the church, your eminence, and I'm perfectly happy to be <laughs> obedient to this. I, um, I don't think we have Cardinal Spellman's reply to this one. <clears throat> Critical fidelity. The church as the context in which we have to learn to be disciples but a church which always needs to be challenged to be itself. Challenged to be itself. And this is where I think some of what Loveday was sharing with us earlier this morning is, is pertinent. The church gathers in order to be reminded of who and what it is. And for Dorothy Day, the vocation that she lived out and the vocation of the Catholic worker movement was to go on reminding the Catholic church to be what it said it was. That is, the body of the Prince of Peace on Earth. I quoted last night to Mother Maria on the different ideas of beauty that we live with. And similarly, Dorothy Day has thoughts about beauty and thoughts about love in a very famous phrase which actually provided the title for one of the biographies of her. She said, love can be a harsh and dreadful thing. She quotes that, I think, from Dostoevsky, whom she loved. A harsh and dreadful thing, and the book about her is called A Harsh and Dreadful Love. Because love for her is something profoundly different from sentimental feeling, profoundly different from benevolence. It is, yet again, the solidarity that God shows with God's people and God's creation. And that can feel harsh and dreadful. To be where God is, is not to be in some comfortable spiritual world, but to be alongside those God made and God loves, whoever, wherever they are. And it's there that we find beauty. Mother Maria writes about recognizing the beauty of God's image in the ugliness of what's around us. And here's Dorothy Day writing about the little brothers of Jesus who are living in the slums of New York. They live in a slum yet surround themselves with beauty. They take a grimy apartment in a miserable east side tenement and they see that it is scrubbed and cleaned, bright and shining, painted so that it will last and then so simply and barely furnished that the crucifix and the holy icons light up the place. The beauty of simplicity, and simplicity as a sign of solidarity. Her own vision was very much that of the Little Brothers and their great founder, Charles de Foucault, in the 19th century. And for those of you who don't know, the Little Brothers are an order whose vocation is to live in the heart of the city, spending a couple of hours a day in silent adoration and taking low paid jobs locally. And that's it. That's all there is to it. They're to be there with God and there with God's people. End of story. And the little sisters likewise, who currently have um, <clears throat> a presence in all kinds of environments around the world, including North Africa, in predominantly Muslim environments, and in Northern Ireland too. One of my great friends spent a year with the Little Sisters in Northern Ireland recently and spoke about the, almost the effort of just being there with God and with others. The effort it takes to do nothing more than that the real effort of doing less than you think you ought to be doing, because less really is more in this sense. So that working many hours a day as a dinner lady in a local school, or a carer, or 
some other low-paid, low-status job, and getting up at five every morning to spend your hour in front of the sacrament in chapel. That's it. God's solidarity with us, being where God is. So Dorothy Day's picture of the church <clears throat> was a picture of a community which was constantly in need of being summoned back to its better self, a community whose destiny and calling was not to be an overwhelming, powerful presence in the world, but a standing question to the world, but also more positively, a standing encouragement to the society in which it was set to become a place where it was easier to be good, where it was more natural to be humane and to be compassionate. Her life of protest was pretty well uninterrupted, and she went on getting arrested well into her 80s. And the protests were about the war, they were about racism, they were, of course, very active in the civil rights movement, they were also about the death penalty in the United States. They were among those who would regularly gather to protest outside penal institutions where the death penalty was being inflicted. And what strikes me about this is the seamless connectedness of the witness of the Catholic worker and of Dorothy Day. If you're going to be concerned about X, you need to be concerned about Y. If you're concerned about homeless vagrants, you have to be concerned about peace and justice generally. If you're concerned about the death penalty, you need to be concerned about the war in Vietnam. If you're concerned about those who are poor and suffering on your doorstep, you need to be concerned about those who are poor and suffering nationally because of their race, their economic deprivation. She was also passionately conservative upholder of traditional Catholic moral teaching so that she was consistently opposed to abortion. But unlike most conservative Christians, Catholic and Protestant in the United States, she believed that if you were against abortion, it was because you were in favor of life in every sense and in every setting, and that it was ludicrous to be an opponent of abortion and a supporter of the death penalty or the war in Vietnam or nuclear armaments, which is something worth thinking about, just as it's worth thinking sometimes the other way around about how much our attitude to abortion can be inflected by or influenced by what we think about other life and death issues. Dorothy Day was an uncomfortable absolutist about this as about pretty well everything, but she leaves a question, which for me is, is a serious one. But the joining up, that's what I'm underlining, the joining up of diverse issues, the ability to see that you can't pick and choose where human dignity is concerned. You can't pick and choose where human dignity is concerned. So the demands made by the serving and honoring of human dignity in one context are going to be urgent and real in other contexts as well. And that's one reason, I suppose, why she was always very cagey about signing on for any kind of crusading mentality. She lived, remember, through some of the most passionate and outspoken anti-communist years in the United States. She lived through McCarthyism. She lived through all the rhetoric of the Cold War at its coldest. And during that period, decided to visit Cuba. So here she is writing about Cuba. I have one assignment to inquire about torture, which the Castro government claims it has done away with. This attitude generates fear, which in turn leads to that teaching of self-defense. A man has a right to defend his life and a right to give it up. Then last night, Father Foley, one of our best priests, said in talking of evil in the world, communism is an example. If he'd said hatred and fear 
the hatred of God and man's religious nature, the attempts to crush it in the name of man's liberties, I could understand him. But what if this hatred of religion has stemmed from seeing religion used by big business? I took God into partnership and so I prospered. These are the actual words of a steel magnate who hired armed guards to shut down striking steel workers. As long as the profit motive is the predominant one and not the common good, religions should have a hard time getting along in the capitalist system too. In the Osservatore Romano some years ago, the leading editorial writer said capitalism is a cancer on the social order. At Blackfriars, the excellent Dominican monthly had an issue, Who Baptized Capitalism? The thing we should all remember is that in Cuba, the job the revolution is undertaking is to build a social order more in accordance with human needs. She doesn't want to justify all that's happened in Cuba, and she's not starry-eyed about the Castro regime. But she's asking the key question, where does hatred of religion come from? Looking at the violent reactions to religion in much of the communist world, in the 50s and before that, and indeed since, she's saying, what if that hatred is simply a hatred of the instrumentalizing of religion by capitalism? A hatred of the way in which we have learned to use religious rhetoric to gloss over or soften a whole set of injustices and inhumanities. Should we be surprised then that religion and religious people pay a very heavy price when revolution comes. The first job of the Christian, it seems to me, is to grow in faith in God, in his power, in, his, in the conviction that we are all held in the hollow of his hand. He is our safeguard and defense. This faith, which we must pray for, does away with fear, which paralyzes all effort. I don't want to play down martyrdoms, but to keep in mind always, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. God loves all. God wills that all be saved. But we have that great and glorious gift of free will, which distinguishes us from the beast, the power of choice. We often choose evil because it has the semblance of good and seems to promise happiness. So, at the root of Dorothy Day's vision is trust, trust in God. When the church seeks to secure its position in one way or another, to secure its position economically or politically or in other ways, it's showing its lack of trust. When the church marginalizes or even tries to silence those in its midst, Radical pacifists like Dorothy Day, who believe that there's something more important than self-defense at issue in international relations, again, the church shows its lack or loss of faith in God. And a lack or loss of faith in God is essentially a loss of God. If you're not acting as if God is to be trusted, what is this God you're talking about? And I think perhaps that's the force of Dorothy Day's witness. If you're not acting as, as if God really were to be trusted, what are your words worth? So her pacifist witness, her constant protest, the life of the Catholic worker houses, all that goes with that, all that is really saying, let's see what it looks like if we act as if God were to be trusted. Bringing back, you might say, into general discourse the question of what God might really be, an active God, a trustworthy God. If we're always trying to keep ourselves safe from the possible consequences of trusting God, God clearly is not really to be trusted. So how are we to cope with a figure like Dorothy Day? I have a nasty suspicion that if I had been Dorothy Day's bishop, I would have had as hard a time as anybody with her. And I, I suspect every bishop and probably every church leader ought to read Dorothy Day's diaries just to remind themselves of what 
what it might be like to be up against radical faithfulness. I find many aspects of Dorothy Day's personality and teaching extremely hard, not just the radical pacifism, but also the absolutism which she brings to pretty well every question. She found the 1970s and early 80s a very, very difficult period because she was deeply unhappy with the way the sexual revolution was unfolding. She felt that the integrity of the church's witness was compromised when people compromised on sexual ethics, traditional sexual ethics. And as she said, she felt she had some uh, locus standi on this, having known what the chaos of free love was like in her earlier life. But she could be, as she herself freely admits, she could be censorious, impatient, and profoundly unsympathetic. She wasn't an easy woman. She was, I think, a less naturally lovable woman than Mother Maria. You don't get the sense that she, she would give you a warm hug in the way Mother Maria obviously would and did. But that edgy, angular witness, that unwillingness ever to compromise on the seriousness of the questions, that is one of the things I have to say I treasure in her. The church, we often say, needs a prophetic voice. And frequently, when we say the church needs a prophetic voice, what we mean is the church needs somebody to say even more loudly what I would like the church to be saying. <laughs> Prophets are, by definition, difficult people. They're not infallible. They're not necessarily nice. They're not easy. And to say we need prophets is to say we need people who will ask us questions we'd rather not be asked. And I think that's what Dorothy Day does. And I thank God for her, not because she is an easy, easily lovable person, but because that rock-like integrity, that utter consistency, that ability to connect things that we more comfortably keep in separate compartments, that is what gives the church the gift of a real challenge. But to be a little bit more positive, I think that her own positive vision of the church is, as I said at the beginning of these remarks, something we might very well take on board and reflect on more deeply. What are we here for? We are here to make communal, generous, forgiving, interdependent, just, equal human life just a little bit less unlikely in the world. And if that sounds like a modest ambition for the church, look around, because it isn't. <laughs> the church, it seems to me, is there among other things, but very significantly, very centrally, to say to a world of injustice, violence and conflict, it doesn't have to be like this. It is not natural for us to be tearing each other's throats out. It is not natural for us to be screaming abuse at each other. It is not natural for us to be dehumanizing one another in various ways, whether through internet debate, economic policy, or international strategy. It is not natural in the sense that it's natural that summer follows spring. Human nature is something else. And the gift of the gospel and the gift of the body of Christ is a restoration of what's natural. As I've sometimes liked to say, it takes a huge amount of energy, intelligence, and commitment to be evil. Because it is, as our Lord reminded St. Paul, pushing against the goads. It's not so easy, actually. And that's the odd thing. We behave as if evil, conflict, the zero-sum game, were the default setting for human beings. But, to quote Jesus in the Gospels, it is not so from the beginning. And it's that paradisal beginning, strangely enough, to which the church bears witness. Bears witness, 
because the church isn't a paradisal place all the time. You've probably noticed that. <laughs> but the only real justification of the church being there is that it effectively signals to the human race that the default setting is not conflict, is not injustice, that it's possible that things should be otherwise. So a Dorothy Day, bearing her tough, uncompromising, rather doer witness against war, against poverty, against division and conflict in society, in her very absolutism, is simply saying to us, how far do we as Christians take for granted what the rest of the human race takes for granted about what's natural for humanity? How far is our default setting actually that of original sin? Break through that assumption, and what happens perhaps is something like the spare, compelling beauty that Dorothy Day describes in the life of the Little Brothers of Jesus. Those scrubbed rooms with the crucifix and the icon, which immediately makes me think, back to what I was saying last night, of the chapel at Llanvair Penrhys, which, as you see, is haunting my reflections in these days. What if that's what we're here for? And that takes me back to the text I read just now, the faith we must pray for does away with fear. Dorothy Day was a notably fearless person. Nothing at all seemed to intimidate her. The legal system of the United States, the canonical system of the Roman Catholic Church, the abuse and threat that she faced daily in these very unsafe environments that were the Catholic worker houses of hospitality. Reading her diaries, you see her in various levels of almost despair about the work. You see her angry, intolerant, and unfair. And it must be said, recognizing almost immediately the anger and the intolerance and the unfairness, one of the things that makes her a holy person, I think. But what you don't see is fear, nervousness, anxiety, fundamentally, she knows that God is to be trusted. And when she writes about her own conversion to Catholic Christianity, that's how she writes about it. A discovery not of a set of ideas, but a set of convictions about the trustworthiness of God embodied in the living, continuing community of Christian people. That's what she wanted to serve and to maintain as a Christian disciple. So, one last quote from her on this. Sorry, again, if I can find I've got too many bits of paper in this book, I can see. She's writing about ministry, among other things, ordained ministry. There are so many priests who are highly nervous, suffering men in their prime, and usually everyone says they're working too hard. That may be true. Peter Morin would say they didn't do enough physical work. Baron von Hugel speaks of the necessity of living on three levels, physical, mental, and spiritual, to relieve the tension. And Gerald Hurd once said, there is a great hunger for tenderness and love expressed in our lives. People are afraid of being considered sentimental if they speak so. Watching adolescents or young people up to 20 when there's a small child in the family, see how much loving and petting the little one gets. Parents are not afraid to express themselves with the little ones, but neglect to show love to older children. Priests lead to sedentary lives. Their study is too one-sided. All over the world, people seek guides, a book, a leader, a teacher, a guru, a staretz, a spiritual advisor. If we are faithful in seeking, we will find one. Seek and you will find. 
if we will pay attention to those whom God sends our way, he will continue to send more. This is trust in God, to be content, but always discontented with one's state, to be loving, grateful, uncritical of God's direction of me, even if I see with my human critical faculties the limitations of my advisers, which she certainly did. <laughs> but an interesting bundle of reflections and one of the fascinating things about the diary is to try and connect what she's jotting down at different points during the day and how her mind slips from one subject to another. Priests. Priests who are strained and stretched. Well, is the answer perhaps not just that they're overworked, but that they haven't understood what work might mean? Perhaps they should get out into the garden more. Perhaps they should walk. Perhaps they should do more cooking. I was at a conference a few weeks ago with, with the great Marilyn Robinson, whose novels I hope will be known to you. And when somebody asked basically about how you saved the world, um, the answer, <clears throat> like they do, um, <laughs> the answer really was, what about cooking and gardening for a start? Because the tension, the overwork that I think Dorothy is underlining here is the tension that comes from thinking Essentially, you've got to do it. How far is the church the prisoner of that we've got to do it mentality rather than trusting God? Because if we pay attention to those whom God sends our way, he will continue to send more. Dorothy Day believed quite seriously that the spiritual guides and directors God was sending to her were not just the priests and the bishops. They were also those who came knocking on her door. They too were spiritual guides. But if you're so tensely committed to systematic overwork of a certain kind, if you're not living adequately on the physical, mental, and spiritual levels altogether, if you're blocking out one bit of that complex of human interaction, then somehow you're less receptive and you're missing out interesting that she puts this in the middle of it, on that hunger for tenderness that's alive in all of us. So she is, I think, ultimately looking to a community in which, first of all, there is a trust that takes away from us the burden of having to justify who and what we are at every moment community in which there's a balance of physical, mental, and spiritual. A community in which we are free enough to be tender with one another. Not to be too afraid of being sentimental. To show warmth, commitment in the obvious human ways to one another. And if our communities work like that, perhaps they will indeed do that fundamental job of helping the world to be a place where it is easier to be good. Thank you. As we did last night.